about it. Um, how you heard about it, either on Facebook, next door to Westland Library, or the Westland website, or some other uh, outlet. Uh, you can sign up for uh, future presentations and view videos of past events by going online. And I will post the link for the Sustainability Education Series site. I'll post it in the chat room. And um, it's, it's free. It's an hour long. And we got some great subjects coming up. And you can see the schedule through July on our website. And again, I will post that link on the chat room. So why don't we get started? Um, our speaker tonight is Bethany Ray, and she's a habitat technician for the Backyard Habitat Certification Program. She's lived in Bol uh, Westland Bolton neighborhood uh, about a year and a half. She loves working in her own yard, and that's good. And she enjoys helping others in town build backyard habitats of their own. So I will go ahead and turn it over to uh, Bethany and enjoy. Hi, you guys, can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay, good. I'm gonna share my screen here and then we'll get started. All right, can you see my slideshow? Yes. Yeah, we can see it. Yep. Okay. You don't see my notes, right? You just see the slide. Cool. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, my name is Bethany Ray. Okay, and um, I'm excited to present for you guys. I've been Habitat for the Westland for that whole time, a year and a half, and been doing them for uh, Clark County, Washington for about three years. So I'm excited to share a little bit about our program with you guys. And it's pretty um, casual. So if you have a question, feel free to, to ask, but also um, we'll save a little time at the end for question and answers as well. Um, yeah, so we can get started. I'll just start with kind of an introduction of what the program's about and then tell you how you can get involved. Um, so the program, Backyard Habitat Certification Program, it's run by the Columbia Land Trust and Portland Audubon. And we cover four counties right now. So that's Clark County, Multnomah, Clackamas, and um, Washington counties. And we work on properties under an acre. So if that um, describes your property, you'd be eligible to sign up. So I just wanted to share a couple pictures from my own yard for you guys just to see what it looks like after being here a short amount of time. Um, just got my certification in progress sign, some farewell to spring flowers, a new water feature, and a rain garden. So those are a couple little highlights from my own backyard that I um, wanted to share with you guys. I'm getting some feedback. Is everybody muted? Bethany, this is Jerry. I'm gonna I'm gonna mute the the folks who aren't muted. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'll continue on. the The program is co managed, like I mentioned with Columbia Land Trust and Portland Audubon. Columbia Land Trust is a nonprofit that conserves and cares for the lands and waters and wildlife in the Columbia River region. And so if you thought of a hundred mile band north and south of the Columbia River from Astoria to the Dalles, that's the zone that the Columbia Land Trust is focusing on. So it's a, about 200 mile wide um, strip that is their primary target area. And, um, so far, they've got about 43,000 acres of land that they either own or they have conservation easements on to protect it. And so if you think about that big stretch of land, the Portland metro area holds a lot of crucial habitat potential. And so this program is serving their needs um, of trying to conserve 
as much land as possible to make corridors between people's yards and all these small tracts of land with the larger green spaces and conservation um, efforts going on throughout the larger region. If you think of it like a patchwork quilt with all these backyards working together, they create habitat corridors for the larger natural areas that are out there. And then most people have heard of Portland Audubon. Um, the Audubon Society here in Portland has a really active in um, advocating education programs and um, while we kind of their focuses. And when you, um, anything we talk to create habitat for the birds is right and aligned with their mission, as well as um, spreading the work of Portland upon from specifically the urban core of Portland out further as we get as we've been so this program fits their broader conservation effort with the different cities and agencies to provide this program. This, uh, this picture shows their certified backyard science, and that just means that all of them have gone through the same process of um, creating and building habitat in their yard. The mission of the program is to work with urban and suburban homeowners, renters, schools, places of worship, community gardens, and commercial spaces to provide the information and tools and resources for gardening sustainably and providing wildlife habitat. And this local program is um, tailored to the native plants of our area um, and meets the biodiversity concerns and local climate change um, initiatives that people are concerned about here. So there are other programs that focus nationally, um, but we've really honed in on our local um, habitat needs. This is a quote from a book that we really appreciate um, by a entomologist named Doug Tallamy, and he wrote a book called Bringing Nature Home. And we'd recommend that book to everybody um, it says, in the past, we have asked one thing of our gardens, that they be pretty. Now they have to support life, sequester carbon, feed pollinators, and manage water. And with every new piece of information that comes out about climate change or the extinction of a plant or an animal, it just seems like there's a growing sense of urgency to address these things. And so um, that's what our program is all about, helping people take achievable action um, one step at a time. And if you think about the power of just the land held by urban gardeners, um, there's a lot of potential for change if we all do a little bit in all of our backyards. Another important thing about this area is um, we're in the Pacific Flyway. And so our region sits at an incredible crossroads with the confluence of the two rivers and then north, south, east, and west migration routes. And so with that in mind, like we have birds flying from Alaska to Patagonia through our region. And so anytime we can provide more of what those food sources and breeding grounds um, for those birds that we can, then uh, we're supporting not only our resident birds, but the ones that travel through as well. Another reason that this program is existing is to um, focus on wildlife in decline. So there's a lot of different wildlife in our region, but studies are showing that many are vulnerable. So there's about 157 species of birds that are found to be vulnerable to climate change, as well as um, 30 species of bees that are either possibly extinct or critically endangered, and 58 species of fish and amphibians are also endangered. And so um, yeah, just with all those things in mind, if we can do things to reduce the hazards in the built environment and create more habitat where it's been lost by development, then we're doing uh, what we can to help kind of buffer the negative impacts of development and increase opportunities for wildlife to exist too. There are things that we can control and um, that would be things like making up for the lost habitat. So wherever we can plant native plants 
in our gardens. Um, if you think about what were the conditions like before my house was here, that can kind of give you a sense for what you might want to focus on replanting with. And you can do things like planting trees, which helps mitigate the effects of climate change. And we can reduce man-made hazards like pesticides. Um, also our pet cats are a huge um, factor in bird, um, like just the number of predators that are in the, in the environment now with all of our pet cats outside. Um, keeping them inside can be a huge thing. Having windows um, treated in such a way that they can, the birds can see them. Uh, window strikes is a big problem in urban areas. And so between cats and window strikes, um, those are the top two reasons that birds are dying in the built environment. So if we can address those things, that helps a lot. Um, reducing invasive species can really help with habitat biodiversity and giving the native plants a chance to thrive. And then, yeah, whenever we can reduce our chemical usage, then we're um, adding less um, toxins to the environment and giving our native insects a chance to, to thrive. So when we have the option, and this is a great picture of um, someone's yard who's gotten certified and they've got a, just abundance of wildflowers. Like whenever we have the option to choose native plants in our yard, that's um, a great use of the space, not for, only for ourselves, but also with uh, the broader neighborhood and our feathered, um, feathered and furry neighbors in mind too. So that was a little bit of the why. And then here's a little bit about the, the how and the history of the program. Um, the program is a unique partnership, like I mentioned, between Portland Audubon and Columbia Land Trust. We started in 2008 um, and it went Portland wide in 2009. It's kind of inspiring because it was um, a neighborhood initiative around one park, in Markham Nature Park in Southwest Portland. And it was a bunch of neighbors whose yards backed up to that park who were trying to tackle the ivy. And they realized that unless everyone in the perimeter of the park tackled the ivy, they would never really conquer the problem. So they teamed up together to work on it and um, got some grant funding. And long story short, the model expanded so that city um, conservation managers wanted to take it citywide in 2009. And since then it's now expanded to four counties across the region. So um, a little idea in one neighborhood park spurred on a region-wide program. So don't think any idea is too small. But um, the program provides technical assistance, discounts and incentives. So we have um, coupons to local nurseries and um, book sellers and other things. And then uh, encouragement and recognition. For some folks, it's all about um, that initial assessment. They really are motivated by the help that they receive in the assessment. Other people are really motivated by getting a sign in their yard and the three different stickers they can earn um, on their sign. And so uh, everyone's motivated by something uh, different, but the point is we're providing the resources to get you going in the right direction and have the resources you need to make um, the decisions that you wanna make. The way the program works is, um, you sign up on the website and there's a cost associated with that and it's a sliding scale cost. So we're trying not to make a, the cost a barrier to anyone, but it does um, cost money to run a program like this. So um, there's a sign up on the website, then you get a one hour site visit with a habitat technician. And so that's the role I'm in. I'm some, one of the technicians who comes to the yard and does a one hour walk, walk around with, um, with you Ideally, it helps if you're there. Sometimes people aren't home, but it's best to do it with the person walking around and getting a feel for how you use your space, what your vision is for the space, and how we can um, encourage you along the process of getting more native plants in your yard and supporting the habitat and needs of our local birds and wildlife. Um, we are left then with a resource packet and coupons. Um, so some tangible like plant posters, um, a booklet and some handouts about the various topics in the program, as well as you'll get an emailed site report that is detailed specifically to your property 
about what um, what things you can do to get certified and um, what barriers there might be, like which invasive species do you have, how to remove them, and tips like that. And then you just start getting um, getting busy working on the uh, on your yard and trying to meet those goals. You get discount coupons that help you um, with purchasing the plants. We have resources like a, a landscape directory of landscape professionals who are in line with our program um, and interested in working on your property as well. So we've got things to help you get going. And then once you think you've reached the benchmarks to get certified, you get a certification visit. And um, those are done by volunteers. And so we're always looking for more volunteers to serve um, each region. So think about that if that's something you'd be interested in. And then if you get certified, you get a sign and that's that metal sign um, that you've seen, see in the picture there, Certified Backyard Habitat. And it has a little spot in the corner where it says um, if you're silver, gold, or platinum level certified. You also get um, recognition like gift cards and um, other incentives once you've been certified as well. And then once um, you can continue on from there and get an upgraded um, certification because there's three levels. And so it's built silver, gold, and platinum so you can earn um, a higher certification. And that's really motivating for some people. Other people are just motivated by wanting to remove their ivy and plant something else. So it's all about um, trying to meet each person's needs. The other thing that's nice is the program is adaptable based on what part of the metro we're in. So I do visits here in Westland, Wilsonville, and Oregon City, as well as all of Clark County. And so we have different resources um, for different jurisdictions based on the unique conditions that present themselves in those locations. So what does getting certified even mean? Um, there are five, um, sorry, something happened with my screen. You can still see it, right? Yeah, we're good? Okay. Um, so there's five uh, categories that we're looking at when we come to someone's yard, and those categories have different benchmarks to hit to get certified. So the first one is removing priority noxious weeds. And those would be things like ivy, blackberry, scotch broom. There's a whole, whole list of them. And then planting native plants. We want to see people choose plants that are locally native to our area, um, meaning the Portland metro area. And we have a list called the Portland plant list that we refer to for what's local to here as opposed to local to the mountains or to the coast. Um, we're trying to really be hyper focused on what's native to here because we're trying to rebuild habitat that's been lost by all the development. Pesticide reduction is an important category because we're trying to reduce the amount of toxins. And this is where um, that sustainability piece really comes in. If we're we could do all the things in the world to plant native plants, but if we're using toxic chemicals on our property that creates um, runoff or kills the beneficial insects we are trying to attract, et cetera, then it's um, kind of a spiral that doesn't get us anywhere. So we're trying to reduce pesticides and we give some great resources to help people make those decisions as well. And then wildlife stewardship, those are things that we can do to create a great um, environment for wildlife in our own yard. So that's things like um, having a water source, bird houses, bat houses, um, brush piles, things like that that can um, create shelter and um, water opportunities for the birds and other critters. And then the fifth category is stormwater management. And so with that, it's nice to think like, if it's raining, where is the water going and what can I do to make sure that any water that falls on my property leaves my property cleaner than it, uh, as clean as possible, basically. Um, and as much water as we can soak into our property, even better. So there's three certification levels that I referred to, silver, gold, and platinum. And they just get uh, increasingly uh, bigger goals. So for example, the silver level um, looks for 5% of your yard to focus on native plants. Gold level is 15 and platinum is 50. And that would be a yard that is um, majority native plants all across it. So the three levels are meant to be a stepping stone so that everyone can um, 
do at least a piece of their yard and feel like it's um, attainable. I like this diagram because it helps explain that even better. So um, you'll see there at the bottom, silver, gold, and platinum with those three um, percentages of your plantable area. So the way that works is if you thought about your yard um, from an overhead view and you said, okay, my yard is uh, 50 by 100 and this much of the square footage is the house and this much is pavement, um, the rest of it is plantable. So we wanna see 5% of that plantable area devoted to naturescaping. And if you think of naturescaping as a style of landscaping that's focusing on native plants, um, then that can help you kind of understand what we're looking for. Sometimes people go out and they buy 100 native plants and just kind of sprinkle them around the yard. Our goal in the program is to see people create um, a micro habitat and um, do what would have been happening in nature with but, um, clusters of plants, layering with different canopy layers, and um, building a little habitat. So you could have a friend over and say, let me show you my new native plant garden, as opposed to let me show you around and show you a few native plants. So that's kind of the idea with naturescaping. And you can see in this picture that um, the diagram has five canopy layers, overstory canopy, understory canopy, large shrubs, small shrubs, and ground covers. And then on the left side of that diagram, it gives you the names of a bunch of birds. And so at each level, um, each layer of habitat, there's different birds that thrive um, in those different habitat um, canopy layers. And so the more diversity we have in our plant species, the more diversity we will have in our birds and insects as well. So that's the goal with naturescaping. And why native plants? Just a little plug for native plants. They're, they're um, from our region, so they're adapted to our local climate and um, the conditions of our soil. So that's the first part, but also the plants and animals have evolved here together. So 90% of our insects are specialists and they rely on the native plants for survival. Um, and so that means maybe they only lay their eggs on a certain native plant. So if that native plant isn't there, then that insect won't be there either. Um, and then 96% of birds rear their young on insects. So a lot of people put up feeders with seed and suet thinking that they're feeding the birds, but we forget that the baby birds need insects as the, their primary source of food. So if we don't have the insects, then we don't have the baby bird food either. So with the insects relying on native plants, it's really the key to our food chain to incorporate native plants in our yards. The next section is the priority noxious weeds. And so you might be familiar with some of these, like it's common to see like an ivy removal event where everyone gets to the park and starts pulling out the ivy um, or digging out blackberry. So those are examples of silver level weeds and there's gold level and platinum level. So different weeds at each level and um, various agencies, the soil and water conservation districts and other agencies have weighed in on which weeds that they really want our program participants to focus on. So that's how that criteria was made. But the idea with invasive species is that um, $1.4 trillion in damage um, is caused by invasive species each year. So that could be plants or animals, but if we can get a rein in on those, it really changes um, the opportunity for the native plants because the invasive species create a monoculture. You'll see in those pictures that nothing else is growing besides um, that dense ground cover. Um, of The picture on the left is ivy um, and the middle one too, the one on the right is called yellow archangel, but all of those are ground covers that are just smothering out any opportunity for native plants to grow. Um, yeah. An interesting fact, this isn't from our region, but just to help you think about um, the importance of managing your invasive species, um, there's an invasive tree called Melaleuca. And in the US, there's only eight species of arthropods, so insects that have ever been seen eating Melaleuca. But where it, in its native homelands in Australia, 409 species feed off of Melaleuca. So sometimes folks say, well, 
this invasive species isn't so bad because see there is an insect that eats it or there are birds living in it. But if it were a native plant in its own native range, the number of birds and insects that could um, benefit from it are astounding. So yeah, again, just focusing in on wherever we can remove the invasives in favor of natives, it'll support the whole food web even better. The next category is pesticide reduction. And um, there's a website listed here and I'd encourage you all to check it out sometime. It's called Grow Smart, Grow Safe. And uh, what's nice about this website is that they are a great hub of information for making decisions about which herbicides and pesticides to use. They've ranked the chemicals by um, how toxic they are and said red, yellow, or green. And that makes it pretty simple because in this program, we're trying to steer away from any red chemicals and stick with um, yellow or green options. And so let's say you had a pest problem um, like aphids, you could search for that pest and it would tell you the natural ways first to try to manage it and then give you the green and yellow. And then lastly, the red chemical options to try. So um, for, for example, a natural method would be spray the aphids off right? That would be a simple, um, non-toxic way to manage it. And so it has ideas for all different kinds of pests as you can also search by what chemical you have. So if you have something in your garage and you're curious, you know, uh, how toxic is this? You can search by the, the name of the product or the chemical in the product and find out how toxic it is. So it's a great way to make some informed decisions. Like another good example is, um, the slug bait products that are out. There's ones that are labeled, uh, they, they look the same on the box, but one might say like super or extra strength or something. One is ranked green and the others are red. And so a quick glance at the shopping aisle, you might not realize that um, two products right next to each other, one is non-toxic and the other one is highly toxic. So this is a great resource to go to to check that out. Um, you might, you guys might remember that in June of 2013 in Wilsonville, uh, we made national news for the first time ever, um, uh, because 50,000 bees were falling from the sky in the target parking lot. Yep. That was a big, big story. And so, um, that was an example of a time where pesticides were being sprayed on the linden trees. And, um, as a result, all these bees were killed. And so, um, wherever we can make help people make those informed decisions, that's our goal. Are we good? Okay. <laughs> Did you hear me about the Wilsonville and the bees, or was the other thing blocking it? Yeah, we heard. Okay, cool. Thank, <laughs> thank you. Um, also, I just noticed on this slide it still says that there's an app. The app um, is no longer available. It's just the website. So sorry about that on the slide. That should be updated. So feel free to check out the website. Uh, Bethany, I, yeah. uh, this is Victoria. I just checked the website and it said that their uh, license had expired two days ago. And so it was no longer a safe website that maybe it had been compromised. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. I was on it probably two days ago and it was fine. So uh, yeah, <laughs> um, interesting. So yeah, yeah, just be sure if you check it out that you uh, check for that. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that and thanks for checking out the site. Um, but yeah, it's a really handy resource. Um, okay, so the next category is wildlife stewardship. And so the way that we treat this is as a menu of options. And so for the silver level certification, we'd wanna see you have at least one of these things. For gold would be two of these and for platinum would be three. And what's kind of fun about this category is everybody is really motivated to keep adding more. And so I've seen a lot of people that have, you know, four or five of these elements in their yard and really get a lot of bird and insect traffic. But some examples would be like a wildlife water feature. That could be a bird bath. It could be a fountain. It could even be what we call a bee bath um, for someone who doesn't have enough space, maybe for a bird bath, a, a bug bath or bee bath is a shallow dish. Let's say like a pie plate that has rocks and sticks or sand 
along with the water. And that's a great spot for bees and um, butterflies and other insects to get a drink because in a bird bath, they'll often drown if they don't have something to climb in and out on. So um, wa wa water features are something that everybody can incorporate somehow. Um, nest boxes are great if you're up for maintaining them. Bat houses, bee houses, um, and bird houses all can help provide a niche for critters um, that don't have their natural occurring um, habitat opportunities provided. So think like um, birds that live in cavities in large trees. If we don't have those large old trees with cavities anymore, they don't have a place to nest. So nest boxes can fill that gap in the meantime until we get more big trees back. We focus a lot on cats as well um, and keeping cats indoors or in a catio. That's what that bottom right picture is. Um, an example of a catio, which is just a fenced in patio where the cats have some outside time, but they're contained um, because they're, they're predators. They want to catch birds. And so it would be sad to be trying to attract all these birds to our yards and have outdoor cats at the same time. Um, other options are snags and nurse logs. That would be a snag is a standing dead tree and a nurse log is a laying down decomposing dead tree. Those are great habitat sources. Uh, additionally, reducing outdoor lighting is really helpful for migratory birds and reducing the ambient light. Um, birds hitting windows, there's lots of things you can do to help prevent that. And so that's a focus of ours. And pollinator meadows are another nice way to um, provide a pollen and nectar um, haven for the insects. So those are the wildlife stewardship options. And similarly, the stormwater management category has a menu of options as well. And we look for one, two, or three of those things to get certified at each level. Um, one of those things would be creating a rain garden. That's that top picture. A rain garden is when you make a basin shaped um, planting bed where your downspouts flow water into the basin and it's filtered by the roots of those plants and absorbed into the ground instead of the downspouts going say right to the street first or um, into the, the sewer in some cases. Um, other examples of stormwater features would be removing impervious surfaces or lawn in place of planting areas. Um, just again, trying to create a more of a sponge with our yards and soaking up water instead of letting it run out to the streets to the storm drains. Um, having large tree canopy is also great for storm water because the trees just hold so much water in their leaves and branches um, and absorb so much water from the ground. Uh, leaving the leaves is kind of a double whammy. It's great for storm water because again, it's building the health of the soil as the de leaves decompose, but it's also a place for um, insects to overwinter and be a food source for birds in the spring. So leaving the leaves can be great for both wildlife and storm water. Um, and then eco-friendly maintenance practices is another common one um, where we're looking for folks to try to um, discontinue the use of gas powered equipment in favor of manual or battery powered um, equipment because the noise pollution and the um, pollution coming from like leaf blowers and such um, is, is a major impact on the wildlife. Conserving water is also important. So like uh, not watering your lawns and focusing on just drip irrigation or soaker hoses on your native plants would be an example of conservation of water um, and disconnecting downspouts is well, similar to the rain gardens, just where the water flows over your yard and has a chance to soak in before it hits the, the street or the downspouts. So stormwater management is a, is a big focus of our program because the health of our waterways is so vital to our, our region. So those are the five categories. And then, um, I alluded to this earlier, we have a um, directory of landscape professionals who've been trained in the program to help people get certified and garden sustainably. So these are folks that are arborists or landscapers or designers, um, all trying to approach um, the people in our program, trying to approach their yards with these goals in mind. And so that's available on our website.
as a resource in case you want to take advantage of those um, opportunities. But it's it's hard to find, uh, especially landscape maintenance people. I seem seems to be the hardest category to find um, folks who want to do it with without gas powered equipment and um, in a natural way without chemicals. So if you know of landscape professionals that are in align with the goals of our program, or you think might be interested, we're always trying to add folks to the directory. So point them to our program because we'll train them and add them to their directory. And then it's advertising for them too. So anything we can do to get more green businesses out there would be awesome. We've got other unique partnerships in the program um, as we network with all these different agencies. And now that we're expanding so much, some examples of these um, are community projects like in schools and uh, multi-family developments and programs like that. So we've partnered with Verde and Habitat for Humanity in the Coley neighborhood and helped um, with installing naturescapes and encouraging that um, the program in lower income neighborhoods that wouldn't necessarily be able to do it otherwise. We also partner with Friends of Trees to get coupons for free trees, as well as partner with their in intern program. We've been partnering with the Asian Pacific American Network of Oregon, both at the Harrison School and at the Division Street Bridge. Um, there's been murals put there and naturescaping happening underneath the bridge. So that's pretty cool and also partnering with Intertwine for the Green Schoolyards Task Force. So those are some examples of ways we're trying to get these program concepts out into the community, um, even to folks who don't have their own yard to do the implement the program, we can still um, increase and teach people the benefits of native plants and naturescaping. So that's been fun. If you know of any um, community project potential ideas, let us know because um, we love doing like demonstration gardens and parks and schools and places of worship and such too. For program accomplishments, um, this is kind of a snapshot of where we are right now. There's about 9,000 properties enrolled. That means those are the folks signed up to um, or have had their initial site visit from the technicians or are getting certified. So um, every year we're getting about 1500 new properties across the region. So if you think again of like a patchwork quilt across the region, that's a lot of properties that if you were bird flying overhead, you've got um, resources scattered all throughout town to, to take advantage of. Altogether, it adds up to over 2100 acres um, with 3,000 properties have been certified in the program and um, over 170,000 native trees and shrubs have been planted so far. Um, so that's been pretty awesome. And if you just think about the collective impact of everybody's little plot, it really adds up. Um, we've got a little map here across the region where everyone's enrolled. So you'll see up there in Clark County, all the way down to Wilsonville and over to Forest Grove area. So getting quite the quite the reach and um, zooming into Westland, we've had 140 sites enrolled so far. So um, would love to see more, but that's a great number so far. So feel free to spread the word to friends and neighbors and your neighborhood association or next door or whatever you wanna to do to get the word out. Um, we'd love to, to see more yards signed up. You can um, sign up at backyardhabitats.org. That's our website. The other thing I want to point out is even if someone doesn't feel ready to sign up for the program, if you go to backyardhabitats.org, you'll see um, we've got a blog up now that has uh, like before and after pictures Hi, and stories, um, stories and before and afters of people's yards. So that can give you some inspiration ideas like um, it doesn't do a lot of good to look at a forested yard if your yard is full sun, right? So you can see examples of what different people have done. So that's been inspiring. But we also have a resource page. And the resource page is a huge library of um, different websites and flyers and handouts to cover all these topics. So you'll see a page for each of the five um, program criteria. 
with sub pages under that for each of the things. So like you could find a handout on building bird baths and then you could find a handout on building a bat box and about herbicide management. And so you put all those together and it's a great place, to, even if you're not going to sign up for the program to find information or also for folks that are outside of the region. Like if you have friends or um, family who are outside of our current program service area, they can still benefit from these resources. Basically, if you live in the Northwest, it probably helps you. <laughs> um, lastly, we'd like to thank our program partners, including um, City of Westland. So thank you for supporting the program. And then I can open it up for any questions. Um, these are some quotes and pictures of happy people in their yards, but um, yeah, I'd be happy to try to answer some questions for you guys and uh, support you. And if you sign up, I get to come to your house. So that's cool. <laughs> Well, Bethany, there was a question on the chat, uh, and you could, you've addressed this, I know, but it was, if you have more than one acre, can you carve out one acre segment for a program? And I think you mentioned the percentages, but could you review that real quickly, please? I didn't address that specifically, so thanks for bringing that up. Um, we would limit it to folks who just have one acre, and we re refer folks who have larger than an acre to their local conservation districts the soil and water conservation districts or the extension service, they're better equipped for those larger um, properties and the unique things that come with that. Great, and you mentioned uh, uh, you get coupons to nurseries. I know there's a couple around. Could you mention the obvious two that I know of, nurseries? Didn't mention any specifically, partly because it changes. So we have yeah. a, um, coupon. Let me grab one. I'll show you what it looks like. Um, the resource packet looks like this, and it's a folder full of um, posters and handouts and coupons and things. And so there's a coupon card, and you're going to get a different one each, um, each fall. We send out a new one. So you've got a year to use the ones you have, and um, then you'll get a new one sent to you. So each year it might be a little bit different, but uh, we do have a couple very local native plant nurseries like uh, Dennis D's will give you some discounts and Owl's Garden Center on their native plant departments as well as Bosky Dell and uh, uh, Echo Valley natives, they moved out to Sandy. So they were in Oregon City, but they're not there anymore. They're in, in Sandy. But yeah, some great options in this coupon card. Thanks for asking. There's another question in the chat room. Is there an effective way to control an extensive invasion of Italian arum? That's a really tricky one. Um, it doesn't respond well to herbicide. And so the best way is to dig it out, which is um, depending on how big your invasion is uh, very costly. So some people have decent luck just trying to smother it out. Um, but yeah, it is one of the most challenging ones because the roots um, go down about six to eight inches and there's, there's a bunch of little bulbs. And so when you um, pull, it's just leaving all those little bulbs behind. Um, so when it's a small isolated dig basically like a basketball sized chunk of soil you've got you most likely got all the bulb can you don't even want to come a so big extensive section um um like cardboard or for a couple of years and, and let it um yeah, you're breaking up basically yeah. not have a chance up well, so that's you probably know. the hardest one. Okay. Well, I don't see any other questions on the chat room. Does anybody else have a final question for Bethany? Bethany, this is Jamie. Um, I had a quick question. We had signed up for um, someone to come out and take a look at our property, but um, had never heard anything back. 
And this was back in probably November, December. I'm not sure Bethany's with us anymore. Yeah, I think she dropped off. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Go back to gallery view. Yeah, it sounded like she was having some problems there. So um, uh, I really appreciate um, you folks showing up for this. You know, there's Bethany. Is, is she back? Let's see. No. Okay. Well, anyway, um, you can keep up to date with the um, Just event. Just crashed and came That's back. That? Can you hear me? Oh, she's back. You're still a little broken. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, now. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to turn off my video. And then I'll still answer your question. Pauses it. Okay. Any other questions for Bethany? Yeah, we got a couple of people excited to get started, so that's a good sign. So if there are no other questions, uh, I want to really thank Bethany for taking your time to uh, explain the backyard habitat certification program. And I know there will be several of you, including myself, who uh, we are in the certification that needs some work. Uh, it's a fun program, and it's for a great cause, which is our own existence. Uh, so the next program is March 8th. It will be on urban gardening. That would include small plots, raised beds, container gardening, gardening, and whatever you can. It should be an interesting one. And uh, remember to check our website. I posted the sustainability website uh, and that's where you can go to find out uh, what's coming up next and also look at videos of previous events. So any final questions before we sign up for the next? All right. Well, thank you very much. Yes. Thanks again, folks. And thanks to Bethany for uh, taking the time to be with us. Good night, folks. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Hey guys, sorry, I don't know what's happening, but feel free to give everybody my email address. We will do it. And they thanks. can. And thanks again, Bethany. Yeah, sorry about that. That's really strange. Yeah, it doesn't happen. That's technology and that's bandwidth or the lack thereof. So <laughs> totally. Yeah, well, feel, feel free to share my email address with folks um, and I'll get back to Jamie um, if I can. I'll see if I can find her info and reach out to her, okay? Okay, very good. Thanks a lot. Okay. Good night, y'all. All right. Thanks.